During the last week, uh, there's been a very good example with the story of Baroness Thatcher and how that has been managed of newspapers driving the cultural commentary and setting the agenda. And we've got um, a fantastic next speaker who will talk a bit about that, and that is Tony Gallagher, who is a brilliant newsman who's widely admired for his ability to break stories and also for his work ethic. He's the editor of the Daily Telegraph, and the Telegraph announced recently, as many of you will know, that it was moving to a seven-day operation. And when I went to see Tony last week, I asked him how it was going, and he said, well, we haven't just announced it, we've already implemented it. And I think that's a sign of how quickly things are moving. Although Tony is the editor of one of the biggest titles in the business, he's never sought a high profile for himself. And so I'm particularly pleased that he's agreed to be here with us today to talk about the life of a national newspaper editor in the age of 24-hour news. And we experienced it last night with the awful bombing at the Boston Marathon. So how does that shift what it is that you do as a newspaper editor? What possibilities does it open up and what challenges does it present? How do you justify your place in the media environment when there's so much competition? Before joining The Telegraph, Tony was on the mail for 17 years and in 2006 became assistant editor and was also put in charge of a website called Mail Online uh, with Martin Clark. So he's been immersed in the digital world for quite some time. He tweets regularly, um, and I'm happy to admit to being one of his 14,000 followers. And in true open journalism spirit, he's also agreed to take some questions at the end. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Gallagher on the editor in the digital era. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here today. Um, Originally, the title and the title in the program says this is going to be a, a day in the life uh, of a newspaper editor. Um, but we decided to change that for uh, a number of reasons. One, I wasn't convinced that a litany of my meetings would necessarily be very illuminating to an audience like this. Um, secondly, a good number of you have heard me talking when I've come into agencies to tell you about how my day operates. Um, Thirdly, and perhaps more particularly, given what Rufus has just very kindly said, uh, it wasn't very clear to me that you could accurately say how one would define 24 hours in the life of a newspaper editor. When did yesterday start for me? Was it when I woke up and started listening to the Today programme? Um, was it when I took the decision what was going to be on our front page? Um, when did today start? Was it at midnight last night when I was changing the front page and creating a spread out of uh, the Boston Marathon coverage? Or was it indeed this morning at 8 o'clock when I was tweeting about our live coverage because um, clearly it's the story of the day? The point uh, I think I want to make is that the role of the newspaper editor and the role of the newspaper is evolving. I'm going to start by showing you a, a slide um, of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, many of you will know, went to the Galapagos. And one of the things that he found most striking in the Galapagos was the way in which uh, the finch had survived. And as he toured the islands, what he found was different types of finch. And what he discovered was that the finch had evolved according to the food that was there. And the finch with a very sharp beak was on the island where there were the insects. The finch with a very round beak was on the island where there was the fruit. And the point I think I want to make here is that innovation is a condition for our survival. And the survival of newspapers is completely dependent on our ability to evolve. There are, I think, five fundamental changes to journalism in the three and a bit years that I've been the editor of The Telegraph. And I'd like to take you through them one by one. Multimedia as well as text real-time coverage, our relationship with our readers, the way in which data is influencing our decisions, and the digital packaging and distribution of our journalism. When we launched our newspaper websites, we were content with a headline, a text, and a picture, as indeed was the reader. 
Over the past three years, it's become abundantly plain that that's no longer enough for the reader. The headline, the text, and the picture are the bare minimum of what's required. Picture galleries, video, live streaming video, graphics, readers' contributions, and the live blog are now central to the reader experience and are taken as second nature by the reader. The editor's job is to select the media that is going to best tell the story. The story remains of fundamental importance, but the way in which it is packaged, the detail that it is uh, surrounded by, is changing very, very rapidly. Two, real-time coverage. We've gone from a single deadline to 24-hour rolling coverage increasingly. It's a phenomenon that was started really with football coverage. Any football fan in the audience will know now that the idea of waiting until the end of a game for a match report is anathema. Every Premier League game is now reported in real time. There is minute-by-minute -minute coverage. Over the past three years, that skill has been taken into the newsroom and picked up with some gusto. We can now run as many as half a dozen live blogs a day. We started yesterday, uh, incidentally, a new live markets blog, and live coverage is now second nature. 25% of the traffic to our finance channel can come from the live blog. 25% uh, of traffic to football is now live uh, blogs. Uh, Boston last night led to Thatcher levels of engagement on the uh, website as people were crying out to know what was going on. Three, perhaps most importantly, reader interaction. When I became the editor, we were largely in the print era in terms of reader engagement, and we relied upon our very engaged readers to write into us every day. On busy days, uh, we could and we can get as many as 2,000 letters a day to our post bag, uh, those, uh, the best of which are selected for uh, the paper. But increasingly, over the past three years, a conversation with the readers is taking place in real time. We now regard ourselves very much as a social network. There are 20,000 daily comments on our website. On really massive days, as many as 60,000 people uh, will take to the website in order to have their say on given stories. What we've discovered increasingly, though, is that they're having conversations with one another rather than with us, where they might start by commenting on a story. Very often, comment threads will quickly become convers engaged conversations uh, between readers uh, for which the story is barely a starting point. And 50% of the comments now uh, relate to conversations that readers are having with one another. A year ago, commentators, opinion writers, would, talk, would regard uh, a mark of success or failure as whether or not they had 1,000 comments on their story. Now, routinely, 3,000 3, uh, comments are taken as the benchmark of success for our best uh, commentators. But it's not just reader comments. Every day, we now have e-polls, and we are routinely getting uh, tens of thousands of people voting on the contentious issues of the day. Ratings and recommendations for stories <coughs> are also very important. And sharing has become a pivotal tool for our journalism over the past year, as readers become more engaged and learn to distribute content via social network. Thousands of uh, stories are shared every day, and our best uh, and most prolific commentators can find themselves shared in the tens of thousands, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, Peter Oborn, Henry Winter, Benedict Brogan. Data, you may be surprised to learn, is increasingly driving our decision-making. What do I mean by that? We want to know what the reader is interested in. We want to know what is obsessing them. Every day when I have news conference at 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock, uh, the first presentation is made by data journalists. We discuss, we use a tool called Chartbeat, which you can see from the marks on the Telegraph website there, will tell us uh, what's most popular, uh, how that compares the, the main story, how it compares to normal main stories in the place, um, whether pictures are working, how popular they are, have we chosen the right picture, is it in the right place. Interestingly, we can also use Chartbeat to analyse long-form journalism, and we can now work out precisely how far down 
a long article a reader has got. Have they got the whole way down? Have they got halfway down? Were they bored only on the first page? And we use Chartbeat to ensure that our website is more engaging and responsive to what it is that the readers want. We use Google and we use Twitter. Google because we're keen to know what keywords readers are using in order to access our website and also to discover what it is that readers are searching for out in the real world. And that will inform what it is that we wind up doing journalistically. So I'm guessing today, without being in the office, that there's a massive amount of activity around uh, the Boston Marathon. There's probably a large amount of activity. For some reason, we massively over-index for Arsenal. There's always activity around uh, Arsenal. And that will inform what it is that we are doing and what we're providing for the readers. Uh, it is influencing, I, I stress, not dictating. So if, for some reason, on Google today, Katie Price is popular, then the Telegraph is probably the wrong place uh, to come. Twitter is an increasingly important tool for us, um, both uh, as a news service um, and in terms of driving the national conversation. Uh, again, we use that to ensure that if something is popular on Twitter and it fits our target demographic, then it's something that we will follow. The heads of department all have monthly data on audience traffic, and it's important for us to work out whether we're meeting our targets for subscription and for advertising. All the heads of department also have access to quarterly trends data. How are we faring on the different platforms, mobile, tablets, desktop? How are our journalists faring? We now have access to data which allows us to drill down and work out how individual journalists are doing uh, on individual platforms and how long readers are engaged with them. The point is that data analysis, and I'm not embarrassed about it, now sits at the heart of our newsroom and, and informs what it is that we do every day. Five, packaging and distributing journalism for digital platforms. We've gone, I think relatively seamlessly, from the newspaper to all manner of computer screens. I would contend that the distinction between desktop, tablet, smartphone is increasingly uh, irrelevant. These are all just sizes of screen on which journalism is consumed. What it does mean for journalism, however, is that digital designers and developers are becoming the new rock stars in journalism newsrooms. And a high premium is now being paid for the best designers and best developers who can package and distribute your journalism in the most effective manner, pop, uh, most effective manner possible. Two weeks ago, we launched an effective evening edition of the Daily Telegraph via the app Flipboard at 4 p.m., if you go on the Flipboard app, you now get an entirely new Daily Telegraph. We're very proud of this, and we're hoping that it will evolve into an iPad edition of the Telegraph, so you'll get an evening Telegraph at 4 o'clock for your commute home. The idea behind this was that we were generating enough stories during the day that we should find a way of curating and packaging those for readers who might want them on their evening commute home. What we discovered was that we're providing more than enough stories to produce a substantial evening edition of the Daily Telegraph. But interestingly, almost none of them make it into the following day's edition of the Daily Newspaper. In summary, the 21st century editor values multimedia as much as he does words. Real time has given everybody in the newsroom a heightened sense of urgency and a realization that decisions that are taken in seconds count far more than decisions taken over the 24-hour news cycle. Readers, increasingly, are part of the story, both as contributors and, increasingly, as distributors of our content. The 21st century editor must draw insight from his data while not being dictated to by it. And he must care as much about journalism on screen as he does in the newspaper. The fundamental role, I would contend, hasn't changed. It's still all about great news stories. I'd like, if I may, to give you a brief snapshot of the levels of activity uh, in the Telegraph newsroom. We're now producing, on average, about 600 articles a day. That's up from around 400 three years ago. The, the number of videos we've produced has risen fourfold. There's about 40 substantial videos every day. 25 picture galleries, at least 25 blogs a day, and an average 
of five live news blogs across news, business, and sport. Perhaps the most striking statistic of all, however, is the fact that barely a third of the output of the Telegraph newsroom now goes into print. Around 70% of what the journalists now do is for a digital audience only. The big story of last week, obviously, was Margaret Thatcher. And I'd like to give you a brief insight into how we covered that over the course of that afternoon. From the moment that the news was announced shortly before one o'clock on Monday, we rolled out a series of news stories and commentaries in the course of the afternoon to ensure that their audience was ever more engaged. From the live news story to the obituary to the first commentaries, a 10-part obituary, um, and the names that you see there, Boris Johnson, Charles Moore, Alison Pearson, half the existing Tory cabinet or Tory ministers from a bygone era. In a 24-hour spell, we produced 75 articles, 26 commentaries, 19 videos, eight picture galleries, three graphics, and a live blog. Interesting fact about the Thatcher coverage last week, which I'd like to share with you, that the most single most popular Thatcher story last week, for those of us that are veterans of the Thatcher era and are obsessed by it, was not all of that stuff that we did, but actually, uh, a, in effect, a Thatcher for dummies. Huge numbers of people were, th were clicking on the article that essentially told you who Ma Margaret Thatcher was. So for those of us who assumed a great deal of knowledge um, uh, about Thatcher on the part of the reader, it was a necessary corrective. At the same time, in the course of the afternoon, I was over over overseeing uh, plans to serialise the Charles Moore authorised biography of Margaret Thatcher, which we begin on Saturday. I green-lighted an e-book on an iPad, and I signed off a 68-page weekend magazine, full-colour magazine, dedicated to Margaret Thatcher. Three and a half million people visited our website in the course of 24 hours regarding Margaret Thatcher. And I've not even gone around to mentioning the paper to you. More than a million people read the paper, and the Thatcher coverage that we provided, I hope, was definitive. There were some 50,000 words on Thatcher in the main book, another 4,000 in our business section, 1,400 in our sports section. It was a story, I think, that we dominated. Indeed, it's a story that reflected very well on national newspapers generally, given the voluminous coverage, uh, much of which was absolutely first class. What does this mean for the future of our newsroom? Well, as Rufus pointed out, we've already implemented seven-day publishing across digital and print. It is clear that the newsroom of the future is going to require new editorial skills. We're actively recruiting people in the field of video, graphics, live blogging, data. Data skills in particular, I think, are going to become increasingly important to us as we try and capture what it is that our audience is looking at and what it is that they're interested in. We've recently formed a partnership with an American company that will allow us to work out what our subscribers, what pages they're subscribing. And from their profile information, we should in due course be able to serve them dedicated adverts relating to their interests. It follows from what I've said also that designers and developers are going to form an increasingly important role in the newsroom and become just as important as our leading journalists. I'm going to finish where I came in with a quote from Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest that will survive, nor necessarily the most intelligent, but the ones who are most responsive to change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. And um, I mean, it's extraordinary just the volume of content that you produce on all the different platforms. But I was particularly struck by the fact that you begin your news conference discussing data, and you also discuss advertising and subscriptions. And I think that's a huge change that have taken place at The Telegraph, clearly. Tony's agreed to take a few questions. So again, it's the usual drill. If you have a question, please raise your hand and say your name and where you're from. And Charlie's got one over here on the right. Hello, Tony. Um, Charlie Varley from Carrot. Um, you are showing there just the sheer scale um, which to me, from an advertising perspective, is sort of retail nirvana of the size of audience that you can actually deliver at, at key times of the day. 
But I just sort of wondered if you could just comment a little bit about there is this rather large gatekeeper there called Google uh, that actually decides what you can and what you can't monetize uh, through your own sort of search engine optimization possibilities. And I just wanted to sort of a few comments about that because I think you've got, you know, certainly from an advertising perspective, ways of actually touch points with audiences that I don't think we're thinking about enough in real time. We might be doing on real time bidding, but we're not doing it when it actually comes to the content and pitching, uh, picking up on some of Justin's point about sort of uh, context and text. But just a kind of thoughts about Google and where Google sets within this and what the way through it might be. Well, Google, I don't think I can provide a definitive answer that's going to be very helpful to you. I mean, Google is the elephant in the room for so many of us. Provides huge amounts of our traffic. It's living off us. Um, I think it's only fair to point out that we, uh, on given days, we're now a lot less reliant on Google than we are on an awful lot of other search engines. Um, it's interesting to me that huge amounts of our traffic is now coming from the likes of Reddit and StumbleUpon. Uh, oddly enough, in the case of Boston last night, the single biggest referrer of traffic to us was uh, Reddit. Um, I think we're, our relationship with Google is still very closely in evolving. Um, we've launched a number of initiatives with them uh, editorially, but it's not clear that by any means they're going to be a benign partner for us uh, moving forward. And I think it's fair to say that we eye them at best suspiciously while working with them as closely as we can. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions for Tony? Okay, sorry, one in the front row and then one at the back and then with the red shirt, pink shirt. Hello, Jan Gooding from uh, Aviva. I have a 17-year-old son who sadly didn't come up with the, the Sumley uh, app idea. I just wondered what you made of, of that as a rather surprising, another plundering of, of the efforts that you do with your wonderful writing. So, say, say again, can you...? Sumley. Yeah. I wondered what you made of that as that yet another... Short, yeah, fine. Um, well, he's, uh, he's a very clever young man. And uh, all power to him. I mean, it's a, um, it's, uh, it's a brilliant tool. And um, it's one that a number of people in the newsroom are using and now reliant, reliant upon. I don't, for what it's worth, I don't think it's as effective as, as Twitter in a, in, a, in a daily newspaper newsroom. And I think far more of my journalists spend time looking at Twitter than they do at, at Sumley. Twitter has, in fact, for many people, replaced the press association in terms of an effective real-time news service. Thank you. Back there. Hi, yeah, I'm Chris Wire, M6. Um, I was really interested in, in what you're saying about the, um, the influx of data, um, influx of uh, reader, reader comments, and how that influences um, change throughout the day. In terms of your role, and perhaps the, the difference between instinct and influence of data, be interested to see how you or hear how you feel that um, has the the role of the editor changed in terms of having an instinct and a gut feel for a story and how whether or not that's that's something you see sort of has been uh, changing for the for the better or the worse. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think you've still got to be governed by your instinct, but none of us are infallible, and I think what the data is doing is allowing us to work out uh, with greater sensitivity exactly how engaged readers are in a, in a given story. Let me give you an example. So um, the Manchester City-Chelsea game on, on Sunday, which was covered hugely on Sunday, covered hugely on Monday, I'm willing to bet, although I've not been in the office, that still today people are going to be searching for Sergio Aguero and David Luiz on the back of the, uh, the tackle. So we are going to have to try and find a way of engaging with that audience today. And I think that's the right choice. If people are interested in that story, we need to find a way of getting into it. So there's data is driving us, but we happen to be interested in it too. Um, I think your instinct is still very, very important. And you have to rely on your gut instinct in terms of uh, whether you think uh, a story is going to be right for the Telegraph audience, what you put on your front page. And you should never allow your instinct to be subsumed by uh, the data. But I think the two can marry one another very effectively. Can I just ask that in terms of the age difference for different platforms, whether that is something that comes into your thinking, whether you feel that one story is appropriate for one platform because the audience for that is younger than for another platform? Yes, it does. I mean, the, uh, the average age of the, n the newspaper reader is 59, and they're unlikely, to give you an example, they're unlikely to be getting large amounts of the X factor 
um, in print. However, uh, the X Factor, for what it's worth, is very popular online. So we're quite happy, um, within reason, to provide a certain amount of X Factor content. I'll give you another example. Um, uh, Vince Cable yesterday talking about One Direction. N not of massive interest to Daily Telegraph in uh, readers, but of huge interest <laughs> yesterday online. And we're taking those kind of decisions uh, every day, all the time. And I think we're getting pretty good at taking them. And it's rare that we find ourselves stumbling into an area where something that we think is online winds up going into print. It's where instinct comes in again. Thank you. Does anyone else have a final question for Tony? Hi, uh, Demi Abiola at PhD. Um, in view of uh, the Leveson um, inquiry, has, how has the Telegraph changed its approach to investigative journalism? It's, candidly, it's made very little difference to the way that we, we go about our daily business, um, mainly because uh, Leveson had very little impact. Um, there were very few lessons that we, we learned out of Leveson, and it's made uh, little difference to the way that we go about our daily business. It has made a difference to the way in which individual stories are covered, and there is undoubtedly a nervousness around individual stories now that's affecting the collective media. And I can think of... Uh, particular news stories that are in the ether that newspapers will not cover, knowing what they do about the Leveson effect and the way in which they've been slightly cowed um, by the knowledge that people are waiting to pounce on their mistakes. But in general, I, I can't pretend that it's had any uh, big impact on the way that we run the, the newsroom. Um, mercifully, it was run on very ethical guidelines already. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>